Yeah, thank you very much, Michael, for the introduction. And again, thank you for coming. It's really a, a pleasure and honor to be here. I have a smooth drive from Purdue, and it's a beautiful day here. And I enjoy my meeting this morning and looking forward for the meeting after my seminar. So I'm going to uh, tell you what we are doing in the field of quantum information and quantum computing. I think, why is not is for it, uh, on the screen? Oh. Yeah, so my, the focus of the, the general theme would be quantum machine learning. And the goal is to develop quantum algorithms for quantum simulation. And once we have the quantum algorithm, we'd like to implement it, and I will see the implementation on IBM quantum computer. And we're doing both electronic structure and quantum dynamics. Uh, so let me just start telling you what we are simulating and what is quantum machine learning, how the quantum machine learning help us in simulation, how do we build the quantum circuit, and how do we implement it on a quantum computer, and we show examples of two-dimensional materials, and then go to open dynamics. What are we simulating in this? As you can see, we solve the Schrodinger equation, the static equation, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and also we're looking how the density matrix evolves with time. And again, this is, we are mainly focusing on open quantum dynamics. You have a system and you have environment. If you focus on the density matrix of the system and you ask, how the density matrix of the system evolve with time, and then you go to the quantum master equation. So in my group, we're doing all these kind of simulation from static all the way down to solving the quantum master equation on a quantum computer. And you can see everything is non-relativistic. And recently we start in the group discussing how to also use the same technique to solve the Rax equation. So what I'm presenting is mainly non-relativistic simulation of the Schrodinger equation and the quantum master equation. And then you ask, okay, what are the problems of, of interest? I mean, if you are in the field, you say, many predict that the technology will have its first killer app in chemistry. So people talk about this revolution of quantum computing to have advantage you solve one of these big problems in chemistry. And the problems are, I mean, you have so many interesting problems in chemistry, but you can look at the structure and dynamics of complex biological system, catalysis, drug discovery, material design, global optimization. We have plenty of problems. And really the, 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 the race is to show advantage of a quantum computer by solving these complex problems that cannot be solved with the classical computer. This is the goal, the end goal. I mean, we are not there yet, but this is what we're aiming to do. Now, we talk about quantum simulation. Now, the machine learning. So if you look at the machine learning, I mean, the classical machine learning, you have big data, and then you have the, the what we call the algorithms. This is the machine, and here we have the classical processor. And the idea is to, for the, the processor to learn correlations in the data here in order to predict a task at the end here. So what we do with quantum machine learning, we add the word quantum to the three steps. So we have a quantum data, quantum processor, and the, the task, our task in this quantum machine learning is solve one of these, I mean solve this equation, is the physical space, where the physical states is our task. So I'm going to use the machine learning really to get the wave function, and get the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, and then also look dynamics. So, so here we don't have data to train the system, and I will show in a minute how this works, but the goal is really, or the task of this quantum machine learning, is to solve these three equations. So you can ask, okay, what is new? I mean, we have this for 100 years, this is for 60 years. So what is new? We have this quantum computer, or quantum processor in the middle, that we are interested in taking advantage of this to learn data or correlation between data. 
And I think that what really is essential here is to look for like quantum correlations, entanglement in these data that cannot be captured with a classical machine learning. Now, why machine learning? I mean, all of us recognize the success of machine learning in so many different domains. I mean, with solar farm optimization, drug discovery, I mean, grid finance, self-driving car. And if you visit Purdue campus, you see these machines that are delivering meals. And this is our president taking his lunch with these machines. It's all machine learning. We see it all over. <laughs> so the success of machine learning is really very, very impressive. And we all experience. But you can argue that there's still an empirical field. It's not an exact science. You have to train the system. You have to do this. You have to do that in order to predict the outcome. And the question is, can we make it more precise? Can we make it a more an exact science? And for us, we're solving differential equations. So it's not we are training data. We'd love to solve differential equations. But if we really focus on machine learning for chemistry and physics, I mean, you can see for the last maybe 10, 20 years, it's, it's the application is in all domains of chemistry and physics, under supervised, unsupervised, or reinforced learning. And you can see from a classification of phases all the way down to optimizing outcome of chemical reactions. So there is a lot of application using classical machine learning. When we talk about the quantum machine learning, we are combining classical machine learning algorithms with quantum computing algorithms. And just to distinguish between sometimes people use the word quantum machine learning, but they mean using classical machine learning to solve quantum problems. And this is different. We are really talking about combining machine learning algorithms with the quantum with machine learning classical algorithm with the quantum computing algorithms. So you can ask, OK, so what quantum can add to classical machine learning? And we'll argue for three things that it's very obvious. Here we're going to use, instead of nodes in the machine, here we have qubits. We're going to place qubits. So we talk about the first, the superposition. Instead of nodes minus 1 plus 1 or 0, 1, you have a qubit sitting there as a superposition. Second, we have the interference phenomena. So interference here related to machine learning. You're going to put your system in a superposition of all different states. And then really the big thing is to design your algorithm in a way that the constructive interference take you to the answer. And we all recognize this in the Shor algorithm. So Shor algorithm, when you find the period of a function which related to factoring, is exactly this is what happens. You have you have constructive interference which allow you to calculate the period. So this is why we don't have a lot of algorithms. I mean, if you think about it, this is really the main thing when you have advantage in a quantum versus classical, when you are able to design your algorithm to take advantage of the constructive interference between the waves. And the third one, of course, is entanglement. It's a strong correlation with no classical analog and probably by now you heard the news this morning when they announced the Nobel Prize in Physics 2022, they give it to entanglement. And the early experiment in the 70s and 80s that showed that entanglement violates many inequality and it's, it's a property of quantum mechanics. And this is really exciting to see that the Nobel, laureate, the Nobel Prize went to the, the field of entanglement, which is probably the basis for all the revolution in the field of quantum information and quantum computing. So if you read the literature now, what people do, I mean, you take classical machine learning, and they look at the size, I mean, the scaling as a function of the size n, and they try to see how do you quantize this algorithm and get a better or advantage over the classical machine learning. So this is what you'll see in the literature, that people trying to re quantize these classical machine learning algorithms. So for those who would like to like start looking at this feed, I recommend this quantum machine learning, which was a review article in back in 2017. And you can see the, what they do in this article. They start with a principal component analysis from a classical machine learning, and they add a quantum. They have super vector, the, the support vector machine 
for classification, the array quantum. And you can see the development from classical machine learning into quantizing these concepts in quantum mechanics. Well, let's get back to electronic structure of, uh, of molecules and materials. And before going to the quantum machine learning, I'll just give you a general overview, at least related to what we have done in the group. We are in the business for over 15 years now and why we choose to go to quantum machine learning. I mean, there are other algorithms in the field, like phase, quantum phase estimation and algorithms. So I'd like to give you this overview, and this will lead to the quantum machine learning algorithms. And we're doing electronic structure. So the first thing when you do electronic structure, people ask you, oh, wow, we're doing this research for 80 years. And we have so many methods of an issue, semi-empirical, density functional theory with all the functionals. And you have non-conventional conventional method. We have so many Nobel, Nobel laureate in this field. And ask you, okay, why do I need another method? So first of all, you really have to answer this because we have so, we're doing research for 80 years and first you have to justify why quantum computing is, uh, is going to help you in this field. Again, to reach chemical accuracy, and now experimentalists can do better than one kilogram per mole, the computational cost grows exponentially with the size of the system. Because the only method that systematically you can get accurate results is the configuration interaction. It's a variational method, you increase the size and you go from above and you go lower the energy to the ground state. So this is the only systematic way we know the variational method to get accurate results for this system. And if you would like to reach high accuracy for large system, this is an exponential scale exponentially with the size of the system. So the hope that, I mean, still we are not there, but the hope that with quantum algorithm, we can go from exponential scaling to polynomial scaling. I mean, this is the hope, but the question if we have enough, we'll discuss it if we have machine to do that. But so far, there's no example that we see we have an advantage yet over classical computing, but this is really the end goal of quantum algorithms. Can we turn exponential problem into polynomial? Now, when we do electronic structure, I will not go through all the details that become standard. You have to map your Schrodinger equation into the qubit space. So the way to do it, one way to do it is to go to the second quantization and write your Hamiltonian in terms of phrasing and lowering operator, and then use transformation, which transform from fermionic into qubit or spin state. And there is a well-defined Jordan Wigner, Breivik ETF, that take you from the second quantization into the qubit space. And we work with the focus space here, empty or occupied. And in the early days, we use the phase estimation algorithm to get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for this you and our experiment in a minute. And now recently people are doing hybrid quantum and classical algorithms. And at the end you do measurement to get the, the state. So now I didn't go through the details because mapping this is really, so you have so many open source packages with all the companies in the field, they have it. You can go there and transform any Hamiltonian to the qubit space. So it's, it becomes a routine, subroutine that all the the big companies, they offer like how to do it and it's an open source packages. Now just to summarize what we have in this field, it's like a, we have results from two to 12 qubits, but the exciting things, this, it's not only algorithm, people already tested with all the platforms from early work in the wave, NMR, optical, traps, ion and superconducting. People running small molecular system, like H2, water, lithium hydride, and all these simple molecular systems on all the platforms. So in principle, these algorithms works. So the question is, how do you increase the number of a qubit within the coherence time? How do you run quantum phase estimation algorithm? And, and all of this related to quantum error corrections to get a full tolerant quantum computer. If you look at this field, you said, oh, this field is resemble what we have back in the 60s, because when we invented the classical computer, people were thinking how to solve the Schrodinger equation on that computer. And if you look at, the, at this publication by Boyce and Shavit and all these guys, they were simulating the same system, H2, helium, 
lithium hydride, the same, the same thing. So you can say we are at early stage, what people have done back 60 years ago. And these are the results from IBM. They simulate these simple molecular systems with 70 qubit. So anyway, the point here is like we're still at early stage and all we have is a proof of concept for, that this system can be simulated on a quantum machine. Now, if you look at computers now, where we can simulate thousands and millions of atoms, no one believed from the 50s that we get to the point where we can simulate all these number of atoms. And hopefully with the quantum, maybe in the future, we reach a similar stage where we can simulate large number of atoms. And this is exciting because if you look at IBM roadmap or Google roadmap, you can see Google, they promise by the end of this year, we'll have 400 33 qubits, they have now 127. And I remember I was telling the, the story that when we have a quantum center at Purdue in 2010 in chemistry, I mean, you mentioned Michael, that center, IBM did not have any qubits. So they put their first one 2016. So we talk about from 2016 to one now, so look at this, we went to over 100 and they promised 400. So things are really exploding at the, at the engineering side. They're, expanding the number of qubits. And again, everybody is like familiar with this next. Okay, what we have these machines with 50 to 100 qubits, what to do next? And what to do next, I mean, we'll, I'm not a, an experimentalist, but the experimenter is really trying to improve the number of qubits, the depth of the circuit, connectivity, and of course the goal is to go to full tolerant quantum computer. At the same time, you start seeing in the literature like is the hybrid, the quantum classical. Whatever is hard on a classical computer, you solve it on a quantum, but the easy part, you solve it in a classical computer and you combine the results. So you have this one, adiabatic quantum computing, quantum machine learning, which is the main subject of my talk, and also the programmable quantum simulator. We have a lot of uh, optical driving of atoms, they can use it as a simulator, and now they talk about 250 to 300 trapped ions. So it's a huge, Hilbert space. Again, just to iterate here, so we have the, the gate model, the adiabatic, which you start with a symbol that you know the Hamiltonian, you know the answer, and you evolve it slowly enough to encode the information in the target Hamiltonian or quantum machine learning. And again, now with the phase estimation, we went to direct method and then now hybrid VQE and other methods, and people pushing this direction both for qubit and qubit space. I would like just to mention this, it's an exciting transformation for us, but we found that the one can connect the Schrodinger equation that we teach in quantum mechanics and the Ising Hamiltonian, that this is the main focus of statistical mechanics. And here the, the transformation is in higher dimensional space. We show how one can transfer Schrodinger to Ising. And the exciting things, this local parameter and the interaction are as a function of the of the atomic and molecular system, like distance between the parameters and, and other parameters. So you can turn your Schrodinger equation to an Ising, and later I will come back to this point because it's really exciting, because it's, with the Ising you have different phases, and the question is what is the different phases in electronic structure calculation is really exciting. I will come back to this point at the end. So just briefly, I mean, we have quantum phase estimation algorithm in the early days to find, and then the first paper we did for with the the phase estimation is the spectrum of water back in 2008. And then what we did back in 2011, we, what we did was literally, this is before the, the VQE, we're trying to design a quantum circuit that simulate molecular Hamiltonian by changing the parameter in the, in the quantum circuit. But here is different from VQE because the cost function that we were interested is really the distance between the exact U which is the transformation that you put in a quantum computer as exponential of the Hamiltonian. So you choose a molecular system, you write the exponential, and there are many tricks to do it. And you, the cost function, you minimize the distance between the U that you design a quantum computer and the exact U. But again, we end up with variational parameters that, that optimize the quantum circuit. And now we see we have VQE where you write your wave function as ansatz and the parameters a minimizing a cost function, which is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. 
I thought this is like a, just to show what people done in the field of chemistry back in 2014. We have summary of 17 chapters. And now there are so many uh, review articles in the field of quantum information for quantum chemistry. So I hope this is like I went fast at the end, but this just to give you an overview what happens in before IBM put their machine to be available to the public in 2016. So let's get back to the quantum machine learning and again, re go back to the challenge. What is the challenge in the field? So the challenge is to describe the non-trivial correlations encoded in the exponential complexity of the wave function. I mean, all of us realize that this is the problem. You have exponential number of terms and the correlation between them is so important that you'd like to come up with algorithm to describe these correlations. So I'd like to just give this one just to show you where we're going with this approach. If you look at Herbert space, it's a huge space. It's, it's like if you look for just 80 spins, and each spin has two degrees of freedom, you have two to the n number of configurations. And then if you take 80, for example, you have Avogadro number of configurations. And you ask the question, do you, do you really need Avogadro number of configurations to describe the magnetic properties of material? And the answer is not. And again, when you look at this, another example, which is not my field, but I looked at this one, is really exciting. If you look at the average size of human protein with 300 amino acid, and 20 base amino acid, so this is the base, so it's not a two, you have 20. So 20 to the 300 is a huge astronomical number. But if you search the literature, you see the number of different existing proteins in all living organisms is 10 to the seven. So all these configurations somehow, or the relevant or the physical one sitting in this corner. And the big goal for us, I mean, this is, I mean, I will talk about simulating this equation, but the, goal, the big goal here is how to, you find in a systematic way this tiny Hilbert space that solves these problems. So we thought about why machine learning? Machine learning because you have a huge space, large data, and somehow the machine learn the important features of the data in order to predict some outcome. So we're trying the same kind of approach. I mean, with this huge space, can we find some tricks or some correlations or features that will take us to this corner and not really search the whole Hilbert space. So this is, this is the big picture of why quantum machine learning. So in the group, we have two different, we look at this from different direction. One is the complexity theory. I will just mention the paper, we'll not talk about it. I'll just talk about this quantum machine learning. And recently, one of my students interested in seeing how quantum machine learning will be related to tensor network and factorization. So I'll focus on number two, but just let me mention what we do in number one. And again, number one, we start using complexity. We create polynomially an entangled state, starting with zero state, and we ask the question, is there any common features in these coefficients? And we published two papers in this advanced quantum uh, technology. And the question again, what states can be created with polynomial steps? So we have these states, and we're trying to see how they can be useful and how do you can map other states to these states in, in this analysis? Anyway, so we found there is like a, this is very exciting common features in this expansion. And we're trying to relate it to something that we are familiar with in algorithm. So now I would like to focus on the main thing, which is the quantum machine learning. And the machine that we are using is the restricted Boltzmann machine. We'll go through first what is the Rescue Boltzmann machine is doing and show some results for two dimensional materials and talk about application in other fields. What is the Boltzmann machine? Okay, let me just start. What is the goal? The goal is to find the, the, the wave function of this. So, the, what I said before, the, the goal of this machine learning is to get the wave function. So, how do you get the wave function? So, what do you get the wave function from this two layer system? These are nodes sigma one to sigma n, these are the visible layer. And you have biases or local, you can think about it as a local field. These are parameters to be optimized on the visible. These parameters to be optimized on the hidden as local field on the hidden. And this matrix omega ij connect the two layers between fully connected layers. So you say, okay, what is the energy describing the system? It's just the Ising type Hamiltonian. So you have the visible with the, and the hidden with local fields and the coupling between the, the nodes in the hidden and the visible. 
So these parameters B, W, and C will be optimized at the end, and the cost function here is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so how do we get the wave function? So now, I mean, why is Boltzmann? Because we look at the Boltzmann distribution. This is the joint distribution between visible and hidden is one over the, the partition function, exponential minus E. E is the energy of the Ising. What we do, we trace out the degrees of freedom in the hidden, we sum over all the hidden, and we only get the marginal distribution over the visible. And our wave function will be obtained from the distribution over the visible. So the distribution, the absolute value is square. So if you square the, the probability, square root of the probability, give you the amplitude of the wave function. So I still have to tell you about the phase. So this machine, Boltzmann machine, will give us the wave function with, in this uh, setting only the, the amplitude, which is the square root of the probability, which comes from the Boltzmann distribution. Again, if you have any questions, please, so can, yes. Yeah, let me just continue because I'm going to show an example. How, I will show an example how this works, so one minute. Yeah, because I have to get also the phase here. This is, so now we get the amplitude. And again, I mean, for this one, you can read about, we were inspired by the early work by Troyer and Carlo that they put it back in 2017 in science, and they show how this Boltzmann machine can solve the one and two dimensional Ising and Heisenberg model for spin system. So our contribution, we took this one, we added the phase, and I will show in a minute how to add the phase, and then how do you build the quantum circuit that implemented, can be implemented on a quantum computer. So let me just go through the steps and connect it with the electronic structure. And this is really an exciting field because we're combining three successful area of research. I mean, we all teach Boltzmann law and Boltzmann statistics. We have the quantum network with all the application and now we have quantum computing. So I would like to merge the three into this field of uh, Boltzmann machine for electronic structure and dynamics. Again, I'd like to mention the course at Purdue is in NanoHub, where professors of Uri data from electrical and computer engineering go through the physics of these three, three phases. And again, in the literature, there's so many work on classical machine learning, or the Boltzmann restricts Boltzmann machine in classical simulation back in 87 by Smolensky, and then here by, by Hilton, and many application for classification for many, many different areas the use of stick to Boltzmann machine. So our contribution is really to take it to the quantum or quantize it and build the quantum circuit and run it on a quantum computer. But the restricted Boltzmann machine was used in the literature for a very long time. Okay, so you ask, okay, so again, what is unique? I mean, they have so many, we have so many different models of uh, quantum machine learning. What is so unique about the Boltzmann machine? So I will mention two important properties. First of all, that I mean, if you look at this perspective in, in natural physics, they discuss in details the properties of this restricted Boltzmann machine. But what is relevant to us, they show that this machine is universal approximator for any, any distribution. And they show that it's given a sufficient number of hidden units, the network is capable of approximating or representing any desired probability distribution. And this is extremely important to have a systematic way to present any distribution in the system. And of course, they took this one from an early mathematical rigorous proof. And this was in 2008. So they refer to this paper, and this paper they show that this is an, it's, a, it's a universal approximator for any, any distribution. The other interesting thing, people also talk about the entanglement in the system. And this is uh, a nice paper by Das Sarma and his group. They look at the quantum entanglement in neural network, but they focus on the restricted Boltzmann machine. And just to make the story short, they show that they prove that the entanglement of all short range RBM states satisfy an area law, so which means the entanglement is, the, it's, 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 it's bounded by the area law. I mean, here you have the area law and this is the volume law. And then they, say, they show for long range RBM, 
not local interaction. States, they show that using the exact construction that the RBM exhibit volume low entanglement. Yeah. Yeah, if you have local, inter if you have local interaction, like a nearest neighbors, I have two examples here, I'll show it's like a local or what we call rainbow. It's like, I have two examples, just uh, let me just finish the two examples and I will stop for questions. Is that? Yeah. Anyway, so we have two things. It's a general approximator and you can do some efficient simulation with this method. Okay, so how do we solve electronic structure problems? So what we will do, I mean, we take our Hamiltonian and here is where electronic structure comes in. You write your Hamiltonian in a basis set, and then you turn your problem into a, a matrix in D plus D dimension here. And you said, okay, I would like to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So you can think about this one, this matrix is already a CI matrix. So once we have a basis functions here in this one, we have the Hamiltonian this, we can diagonalize it. And this is what we do in a molecular system. If you have boundary condition in unit cell for materials, spin models, how do we find, starting with this matrix, how do we define the eigenvalues and eigenvectors? And again, if you go to the phase estimation algorithm, it's the same. You have this matrix and we call it U. You put it in a quantum computer and the phase estimation will find you the phase of this method. So I'm going to describe the results that, I mean, if you miss anything and you would like to go to the details, the results I will, uh, present based on three papers. Early one back in 2018, Nature Communication, we show how the restrictive Boson machine can be used to solve simple molecular systems. And again, we run it also on a quantum computer. And then we put, generalize it, and add this the phase, which I will describe in a minute here. And once you have the, the phase at a complex function, you can introduce boundary condition in the system and talk about uh, materials and we show how to get the valence band first the ground state of two dimensional materials like uh, here the, the graphene and then we generalize it to all state excise state in order to get the band structure not only for the valence band also the conduction so what I'm going to show you as a summary of these three papers just in case if you miss detail or if you'd like to go back to see the details how we did these calculations so what to expect what I'm going to show first of all how the RBM works on a quantum computer, how do you simulate two-dimensional materials, and what are the possible applications in the future for this method. Let me go through the steps. So first of all, we have, we look first at the Boseman distribution without the phase here. This is the hidden and the, and the visible, and you sample over the visible, and you get the probability distribution as a function of the parameters, A, B, W, and sigma and H. And this is the probability will give you the, and then the phase will be getting, getting the phase by an, having another node here with the real and imaginary part. And this is the tangent hyperbole of this function, complex function. So this is at the end, we're getting the wave function as a function of all possible configurations in the visible by the square root of the probability distribution. And then the phase, and you sum over all possible configurations. So this is the wave function with all these parameters. You take it to the cost function, which is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, and you optimize it on a classical computer. So you think about it as a hybrid. So now the quantum circuit that we build is do this sampling and getting the wave function as a function of all these parameters and different signals. You said here is the algorithm. I mean, you start initialize all the parameters at ra with random points, and then you build the quantum circuit that do this sampling and then you go to the cost function which is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian and you optimize the parameters and you go back and forth. Let me just finish with example and then. Start with the complex then you can get, you can get it but when you have a complex parameters, it's hard to build the quantum circuit. Oh, let me just finish and maybe we'll stop for a question because I would like to show all. Yeah, I can start with the complex, but then how do you build the quantum circuit that do the complex is not easy. So we, because at the end, the goal is to build the quantum circuit that do the sampling. So let me finish this because I think we have a few examples here and then maybe. 
So this is a quantum circuit. And now you can see why I need real parameters because other, if it's complex, then you have to, really will be very com difficult to write a quantum circuit that do the same thing. So here is like an example of two nodes and you start with a qubit zero and you have two hidden nodes and these are the ancilla qubits. And you can see I start with rotation to make superposition of all possible configuration. And remember that this theta, the angle of the rotation is related to the local field and the, the, in the visible. And this data is related to the parameter in the hidden. So the parameters that we optimize are coming into the, uh, into the rotation here. And then to build the omega ij is the coupling between the two layers, I need control, control, rotation. So control, control, rotation, and you see the angles here with omega ij, i is the, so you have two layers, the visible and the hidden. So this is the quantum circuit that we build, and this one we show can be successfully sample distribution and getting the amplitude of the wave function. At the end, this is the, so we we'll start with two and then we add one phase and then we make it a complex and then we do the sampling. And I will not go through the details, but we show for this, to get a successful sampling, there is a lower bound for this machine and we have an appendix in the paper showing why this is the lower, so you can get a lower bound for successful sampling. So let's see how it works and then give a few examples uh, how we implemented. So again, we implemented, for example, for simple system with the two qubits and two qubits in the, in the hidden and we have four and say the qubit. So this is the eighth number of qubit and these are the number of gates for this simple system with the four, four and 24 because the control, control rotation, you have to break it into, into 24 flip X and you see the scaling is in terms of. These are the number of iteration and the, when we run it on the real machine. And okay, we use the machine, the students use the machine with the 27 qubits here. And again, all our calculation runs on IBM quantum computer. So you can ask, okay, so we have, uh, we do the sampling with this and I show you the sampling goes like N square or M times N because this is the coupling between M in the hidden and N in the visible where early back in 2010, they show that classically you have to simulate two to the M plus N a configuration. So here, like only this part, it's not the whole four algorithm from end to end, just the, uh, the sampling is quadratic in the number of nodes. Again, that's to summary before we go to the, this is the cost function that we optimize and this is done on a classical computer. So this is a hybrid quantum and classical. The quantum is sampling and optimizing is just the classical. So first we run it for simple like molecular system, lithium hydride, H2 and all these simple systems. You can see the results within chemical accuracies. I mean, these are some very simple systems. And with my student, Srihari and Manas Sajan, we were able to put the boundary condition and see how to simulate a two dimensional system like this is the graphene, and this is the hexagonal boron nitrate, and you see the, uh, the unit cell is very simple. You have only two different, we took the simplest one with the two different carbon atoms, single and double, so you have matrices four by four. Let me finish this one. Uh, oh, it's like, a, you, which one are you talking about, this one? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I mean, she wrote these calculations and we run it on different machines at IBM and sometimes they don't, like if you run it on Toronto and other machine, I'm not sure how the, because uh, let me show you the results because I'm not sure which one, because you have to do error mitigation and other stuff to get the results at the end. So we will talk about this four by four and you can see these are the results from a classical simulation. And these are when the simulator, the chasm, and then this is the machine, real machine, when you do error mitigation. And you can ask, okay, if you don't do error mitigation or what we call in machine learning, the warm startup, which mean we, no, oh, sorry. We solve it at one, one K point. And once you, because remember, we start with initial parameters at random. 
But instead of starting at random and do the calculations, once we have a, a point where we have convergence, so in the language of machine learning, this is a warm start, and we use that one to continue to the next point in case space. And these are the results for the symbol. I mean, it's just, again, the symbol is a 4x4 matrix. You can diagonalize it and get the eigenvalues and eigenfunction. So we did it for both the, the, the graphene and the nitrogen. And now the question is, how do you go to excited state? To go to the excited state, we use the trick from variational calculations. If you know the ground state, you just have to generalize your cost function by projecting on the ground state from the Hamiltonian and by adding a penalty term. And this trick used in variational calculation all the time. You know the ground state, so you project it out of the system and you go to the next excited state. And Manus was able to do the simulation for these systems. And again, we, for this one, we use the tight binding Hamiltonian. So it's not from first principle. People think that we're doing this first principle. We did a, the, the, for the before we use Hubbard Hamiltonian and tight binding. And these are tight binding that fit the parameters with DFT. So it's not like a from first principle. We use a model Hamiltonian to show that this is, can be run on a quantum computer. And again, he was able to show that with this, we took this Hamiltonian with the with the tight binding, and we show that you can get the band structure, not only the valence band, also the conduction band, and accuracy is extremely important. Well, define when you compare it with exact, like 10 to the minus, in this case, I mean, the average was around 10 to the minus six. So again, these are small calculations, not from first principle, but this is a proof of concept that you can run this simulation and you have a quantum circuit that do the sampling and allow you to get the wave function. So this is the message. And then we run a logic calculation for excited state of water molecules, not only the ground state, I mean the singlet and triplet. I mean, you see for a given symmetry, you can filter the state that, that projected that symmetry. And we go for like a water we did as a function of theta, excited states and works very well with this projecting, once you know the ground state, you project it out, and then you continue to get the excess state. And again, many people ask if you start with random initial point, I mean, what about the convergence? I mean, of course, like in any calculations, if you start with a good starting point, like a starting with a mean feed, like hard to you get better convergence, and you don't get stuck in a local field. So you get better results, instead of completely random, you start with mean field. Now I would like to just uh, go telling you about the, our recent work in learning how the machine is learned to go to the ground state. And this is extremely important because you can run it and see what the results. But it's important really to see how the machine itself is learning how to go to the ground state. And for that, we use the, the information scrambling and we calculate the autoc for this machine. And again, we, put, we just finished this one and we put it in the archive, all the details, how this works. How the restricted Boltzmann machine learn how to optimize the parameters to go to the ground state. I mean, this is the big picture. Okay, so this is not a new, new idea. I mean, people use it all the time in physics and it goes back in, to 1969 by Larkin and Oshinkov. And after that, many people use it. And mainly the focus was to see what are the limiting, limitation of the semi-classical approach. Mainly people were looking at chaos. How do you quantify chaotic system? And this was used, these ideas was used early for a quant quantifying chaotic system. And the idea is to look, instead of two point correlation, you look at four. And you see why out of order, because this is the time. B0, and you square it, B0, AT, B0, AT. So you see that you have four, and these are local operators in the machine. And you, I'm going to connect it to our restricted Boston machine so you can see how it works. So people are considering these for a long time, and they show that, for example, if you consider this correlation between the momentum at zero and momentum at one, you can see that, and take the classical limit, you see this is proportional to the exponential of two lambda, where lambda is the Lyapunov exponent. Because in classical theory, Lyapunov exponent will allow you to quantify the chaotic system by divergence of the two trajectories as a function of time. And people look at in quantum mechanics as an indication of 
quantify, or the need was to quantify chaotic system. Again, the autoc is here to describe the spreading of the perturbation happening on one side. So what you have, you have the nodes, you do perturbation one, and you'd like to see how the information is scrambled in the system and how the system will learn to go to the ground state. We just focus on our machine. So we have two layers, and this is the, the Hamiltonian for the system, which is the Ising type Hamiltonian. So this is the uh, autoc that we, de we define. We have two local operators, U1 and U2. Again, U2, as a function of time, you look at the Heisenberg, you look at the Heisenberg representation, which takes you from zero to T. So this is the Heisenberg operator, and we have zero T, zero T. So it's out of uh, order. And now what we take, we take U1, focus on the sigma X on the visible, and this is the index of the node. U2 is the sigma X on the hidden, and this is the node. So we'd like to see how the information, because look, at the end you get the wave function from the visible where you integrate out the hidden. So we'd like to see if you, send, if you have excitation here, for example, how it goes to the, to the uh, hidden and the, how, how the hidden is going back to give you the correlation in the visible. So we'd like to see this dynamics of scrambling of information in this machine. Again, this is the definition of U1, this is the definition of U2, operator sigma x on the visible, sigma x on the hidden, and again, we sample with the sigma z. You don't, something not commuting with the sigma z. And we were lucky that this auto can be calculated analytically for this machine, for the Boltzmann. So we have two terms. One is the cosine, the real, and this is the imaginary. And look at the, the angle, I mean, the... Uh, you can see here is the cosine, I mean, this is the coupling between K and M. So you have the matrix that couple the hidden and the visible. And again, the same here. And there is the, this part sitting in the imaginary part, which is related to the covariance between the two variables. And then we looked at the, quant the mutual information between the two layers. So the mutual information, we calculate the entropy for H, the entropy for V, and this the joint entropy, and the entropy that we talk about is the volume and entropy. So we see there is a correlation between the mutual information between the two layers as a function of the covariance between the variable. But what is exciting, we were able to show analytically the two bounds. So let me just, there is a lower bound, and there is an upper bound for this learning. So all the parameters that really you use to learn about the ground state are bounded from above and below. And you can see the bound is related to the imaginary part of the autoc here. And this is the beautiful results. If you look at the mutual information between the two layer as a function of the covariance between them, and this is the upper bound, and this is the lower bound, and whatever the trajectory you start with, all fall on the lower bound. These are the final results. And this is the final results for Ising Hamiltonian. This is here, we have two parameters, this B and J0, and we know there's a phase transition from order to disorder for this system, and you can see it clearly when you look at the mean as a function of the coupling between them. So it's really amazing that whatever the trajectory you do, first of all, there is all the learning in, it's, it's bound from above and below. So you cannot take, whatever you take, you are stuck here. And then when you let the system go to the ground state, they go to the mutual, the minimum mutual information. So we are now trying to see, I mean, if this is general or this is for rising or, I mean, and we tried other Hamiltonian, which is this one. So we tried with Ising, and this is the, what we call the rainbow Hamiltonian. So this is the Ising type Hamiltonian, and this is the other Hamiltonian, where the interaction between these nodes. And you can see we have an upper bound, lower bound for the information, and at the end, all the results goes to the lower bound. So we're trying to check if minimizing the mutual information is somehow general phenomena in this machine learning. So we're trying to take other Hamiltonians with different coupling here, like the SK, the other Hamiltonian, Eisenberg, and to study, like to see if all they are bounded this way, and somehow this lower bound is extremely important for the machine. So somehow the machine is trying to minimize the mutual information between the two layers. 
So one example, we have five minutes or? Okay. So anyway, I mean, I would like to, we run also this problem of see if uh, we can get quantum phase transition a quantum computer. And we took this simple system, the two uh, level system interacting with bosonic field. People show already analytically and experimentally that the system accepts a quantum phase transition when you look at the energy as a function of the parameter. And this is the jump on the second derivative. And it's not only analytical results in the PRL here by Martin Polin and his group. Experimentally, they were able to show this one by the trapped yttrium ion in the trap. So you look at the hyperfine structure as two-level system, and the system vibrate in the trap. And they were able to look at the order parameter, which is the average number of photons in the system. And they show this is true physical phenomena. You can, you can see the quantum phase transition. Anyway, we run it on a quantum computer with the RBM, and we were able to use finite size scaling to get the criticality. So the point here, I would like just to mention that in addition to the four, we have also this, we can get the finite size scaling on the quantum computer and the results, if somebody interested, we just published it in May in Frontier Physics, how finite size scaling in Hilbert space can be used to obtain the criticality for phase transitions. Just like we'll end here with mention this one, because it's really an, an open problem in the group to try to understand when you move, when you map Schillinger to Ising, you have all these different phases. What is the equivalent of these phases in electronic structure? And probably now 20 years, of, we have proposal that if you look at the chemistry, uh, like dissociation or ionization, when the electron leaves the atom, all these dis processes uh, can be described or the underneath these processes, uh, beautiful critical phenomena. And we show a critical exponent for ionization, critical exponent for dissociation, but now it's getting back because people can do experiment with ion trap. So the point is like when we said ionization, the electron leaves the atom, it depends. Is the electron jumping or the electron moving continuously in a phase transition, second order or first order? And we show the difference between closed shell and open shell system. Anyway, now just to mention that we are looking at long range entanglement with the spin liquid with Arnab and Trump to see, to see if the, the mutual information is still at the lower bound in more complex Hamiltonians. I will not talk about spin liquid and we'll have the Haldane phase here. Sorry. So maybe we'll just not talk about the other project. We'll go to summary, sorry. So just to summarize, we have the six boss machine with the three layers visible, hidden, and no phase. We get sampling on the quantum computer with a, we have a quantum circuit. We use a classical computer to optimize the parameter. It's a hybrid. And we show how it works for simple systems. And then we show one example of the, the quantum phase transition. And then we talked about the autoc, which means we're trying to understand, get deeper into the quantum machine learning and see how it learns to go to the ground state. And we see that the system somehow prefer to minimize the mutual information between the layers. And this will give us, hopefully this is a general principle, not only restricted to this system. And I think this is really an exciting to understand why all system reside in the lower bound. Again, we put, for those interesting, we put a quant, uh, recent uh, review article about quantum machine learning for chemistry and physics. And we published in the Chemical Society Reviews where we have summary of all these different elements. I would like to thank the group that are doing all the hard work here. And we are lucky now to have students from chemistry, physics, computer science, and engineering looking at these problems and funding. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, for us, for this simple system, we have already mean field Hartree Fock results. So we use the Hartree Fock results. But again, it's a mean field. If you have it, it will be easier. But if not, we can random, we can randomize it for other parameters. But since we did Hartree Fock before we do this machine learning, we use the results from Hartree Fock. So it's a mean field calculations. So if you have the results, yeah, I mean, it's like if you have a large system, again, 
and you can run mean fee like heart refocus, then it would be the initial point. Because the whole point is to, get, to recover the correlations and not the mean heart refocus type. So this is, will help us in really getting a faster convergence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have two things. Is the classical computer will optimize the cost function, and this is we are not counting this. We're counting just the sampling, and we show that classically you have exponential and the, the quantum circuit that we sample, it's quadratic with the number of nodes. It goes like n times m, where n is the number of hidden, and m is the number of visible. So like in terms of density, if I divided n by m saying as a function of density, it's, it's really quadratic. So. So the advantage is to run the quantum circuit on a quantum computer and get advantage, a quadratic advantage. But this doesn't mean from end to end because he asked, how do you initialize the system? If I run hard fork, then I have to add the cost of hard fork for that one. How do you initialize the system? And how you do the measurement? But only the part when you sample is the advantage that we see on the quantum circuit. Yes? Yeah, this is what the paper was, yeah. Is there an understanding of um... No, this is why I thought I did not talk about the spin liquid because spin liquid, the feature of spin liquid is, the, is entanglement. So now we're trying to run, we are not, we did not do our restrictive possible machine for spin liquid phases. So now we're trying to see how it works for the Heisenberg type Hamiltonian and if can we recover the correlations. But the paper in Das Sarma that he talked about the entanglement he showed that for that one, it's bounded by the volume, by the volume law. So you can see the RBM is bounded for entanglement by the volume law, but we don't have results to show here. But I think the best answer like uh, to check the physical review X by the Sarma that he talked about the entanglement and how it's bounded by the volume law for long range and for short range is uh, the area law. Let's thank our speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you.